He slept with my sibling, degraded me, smashed my self-confidence to pieces and cheated on me regularly. If you like true revenge stories, you found the best place for your vengeful needs. In this episode, we start off with a husband who finds out his wife cheats, but he went through great lengths of suffering to accomplish the happy life, without her, while she literally pays for it. Followed by a story about a shameless cheating boyfriend who sleeps with partner's sibling, abuses his partner and is cheating regularly while being proud of it. Lastly, in an ongoing story involving private investigators, a cheater's lover gets the first bite of revenge, instead of the cheating partner. Before we start, tell the like button to hold your dignity, because you're up to some sketchy revenge acts. Let's dive in. Naturally, viewer discretion is advised. These revenge acts might be disturbing to snowflakes. Grab a cup of coffee or tea, because this is a long story, but it's surely worth your time. My revenge began with discovering my wife's infidelity, let's call her Carrie. After 14 years of marriage and three kids, I saw a text appear on her work phone for just a few seconds that would forever change my life. It was a message that was sexually graphic and had no business being on anyone's work phone. It was on the lock screen and the sender's name was visible, let's call him Perry. Some background, I married Carrie when I was 25 and she was 22. I was teaching high school at the time and she was a nurse. After having our first child, Carrie became a stay-at-home mom. Money was tight, so I took on an admin role in my department and coached two sports for the stipends. We made it and after a few annual pay raises, I stopped in coaching and took advantage of a program to earn an administrative credential. Once I made the jump to administration, our last child was ready for preschool and Carrie decided she wanted to go back to work. Nursing jobs are always available, but they're not always the best positions. Carrie pretty much had to start back at the bottom, working alongside nurses that were a lot younger than she was. They could work back-to-back -back double shifts that took a toll on Carrie. When she asked her supervisor about other positions, she was told that without a BSN, she wasn't going to move up. At the time, Carrie had only the two-year ADN. I told her that I'd support her getting her BSN. So I would focus in the kids' preschool and after school. My retired mother, who was always willing to pick up the kids from school and watch them, helped us out too. It took her three years, but eventually she had her BSN and was promoted to a better position at the hospital. Things were good for a while. We had plenty of money, so finally moved into our own McMansion, bought new cars, etc. I'd moved from school admin to the district admin, so I had more time to spend with Carrie and the kids. She was working a more predictable schedule and even with my often long hours at work, this change allowed us to finally take vacations to all the places we'd put on a list during our honeymoon. She kept that list in our wedding album. At some point years later, I noticed she's carrying two phones with her. When I asked her about it, she said that it was a phone provided by the hospital. I didn't question her explanation, because my district had also given me the option of a phone or a phone stipend, which I took instead. Again, months went by and I thought we were a happy perfect family. I charged my phone in our den, while she charged her phones in our guest bedroom that doubled as a computer room, so we could keep tabs on the kids while they surfed the web. I was updating software on the computer when I saw a light around her work phone. She had a habit of always turning her phones face down when charging them. Out of curiosity, I reached over to the phone and flipped it over. A message had popped up on the lock screen, asking her when she'd like to be orally pleased again but in much more graphic language. I also saw that Perry sent it. The world stopped around me. I just froze. My first thoughts were, what the hell was that about? It's her work phone. That kind of message gets people fired. Then it hit me. Was Carrie having an affair? It's amazing how the brain works. I suddenly started remembering a lot of things Carrie had done that seemed odd, but I'd either dismissed them myself or immediately accepted her explanation. She was always walking out of the room to answer a call or return a text and claimed that it would violate HIPAA if I overheard her talking about a patient. I accepted this, because education has similar privacy laws regarding students. 
She would sometimes come home with the faint smell of cologne on her clothes and claimed it was from helping to move male patients. Again I accepted this at face value, but it always struck me as odd how it seemed to be the same scent of cologne. Once the proverbial barn door was open, I started seeing a lot of things that I'd missed before. Our love life in the bedroom had cooled off considerably, which wasn't helped by her having to leave the house at odd hours to fill in for other nurses that called in sick. I also recalled where I'd seen the name Perry before and a call to the hospital confirmed he was a doctor there. For the next week or so, I was walking around in days trying to put all of the pieces together. One of our kids had left a book in Carrie's car, so it was an excuse to visit the hospital, Carrie had told me personal visits were frowned upon. My kid went up to get Carrie's car key, I'd forgotten my key to her car at home. I talked to a nurse in the lobby and joked about how work phones seem like a blessing, but all they do is put you on call 24 hours a day. This led to her eventually telling me that the hospital was too cheap to give cell phone to nurses, so only high-level executives got them, which didn't include Carrie. With pretty much everything confirmed, I took some personal time off the next day to talk to a divorce lawyer. The news she gave me was horrible. We lived in a community property state with no fault divorce. I made more money than Carrie, she'd been the primary caretake of the kids, and we'd been married for more than 10 years. Basically, if I filed for divorce, I'd be screwed. Lose the house, pay alimony, she'd get a huge chunk of my retirement, and I'd pay child support for the next decade unless I was lucky enough to be awarded joint custody. The worst thing she told me was, that it didn't matter that she cheated. It. Didn't. Matter. I was crushed. There was only one person I could trust with this kind of information. She was a fellow teacher that had also made the jump to administration, but was stuck at a school site. Let's call her Anne. Anne had been married at 19, but her marriage was annulled when he got some other woman pregnant. Since then, she'd focused on her career and we'd found we were kindred spirits in a lot of ways regarding K-12 education. I talked to Anne. She said something to me that changed my whole mindset, if you don't like the hand you're dealt, change the deck. I realized I had two problems, I made more money than Carrie and she had more time than me to be the primary caretaker of the kids. The second issue was actually kind of easy. At every district office, there are jobs that are fast tracks to higher positions and there are jobs that administrators suffer through, like mess or KP duty in the military. One of these dead-end regulatory positions was open again, ambitious administrators leave after a couple of years when a better position opens up. I sat down with our district superintendent and asked about being transferred to that position. At first he was shocked, but I told him that it was my time to take one for the team and it would fill a hole in my admin experience. He agreed. It was really just crunching numbers with no personnel or student interaction so I could set my schedule, even take a laptop home and work there. With my new free time, I began taking the kids to school, picking them up from school, not leaving them in after school or having my mother watch them, and taking them home. I'd help them with their homework, make dinner, etc. While the end goal was to become their primary caretaker, I can't explain how much I really, really enjoyed taking a more active role in their day-to-day -day lives. My salary hadn't been reduced, so I needed to find a way for Carrie to make a lot more money than she was in current nursing position. I remembered Carrie being mad after she'd earned her BSN and a supervisor told her in the future, bachelor degrees will be worthless and everyone will need at least a master's degree. Carrie had worked hard to get her BSN and that supervisor's comment pissed all over her hard work. I talked her into starting a MSN program. I told her that since I had a much more flexible work schedule, I would keep taking care of the kids. She was reluctant at first, then I said, you could have every evening free to study or go to class, whatever you want to do. I saw her eyes immediately light up, probably thinking that she could spend more time with Perry. To make sure she was actually completing her MSN courses, I paid her tuition and fees directly to her university. It was going to take her between two and three years to finish. Those years were rough at times. I could tell every time she was rushing off or coming back from seeing Perry. There was an excitement or sense of satisfaction in her eyes that just wasn't there when she was doing her coursework. I had to either smile or pretend I didn't notice. 
My temper got short at times and I found myself in arguments over petty nonsense. A couple of times I almost blew the whole charade having to bite my tongue and apologize, rather than scream insults at her that she deserved. Anne remained my confidant through all of this. I'd recommended her for my previous fast-track position and she joined me at the district office. Anne was qualified, hard-working, ambitious and only needed her foot in the door to impress the higher-ups. I even got a few pats on the back for recommending her after she impressed everyone. Anne and I started our own affair. It wasn't some hot-blooded, passionate romance, but two friends giving each other what they need. Without Anne, I wouldn't have been able to maintain the charade of being the oblivious cuckold. But when Carrie would come home smiling after spending time with Perry, I was able to bear it, smiling back because I had my own lover. After three and a half years, Carrie completed her MSN and was promoted at her hospital. Her salary went up substantially and was now higher than mine. When the kids and I made her a congratulations dinner, I made a joke about her being the breadwinner for the family and she laughed, joking back I should be a stay-at-home dad now. A month later, I went back to the lawyer, who didn't remember me at first, and told her the financial situation had drastically changed. With these new facts, she drafted the petition and filed it. When the kids were with my mother, I had Carrie served. The deputy knocked on our front door and I let him in, pointing at my wife. He asked her name and then handed her a copy of the divorce petition. With the deputy standing there, I told Carrie I knew all about her affair with Perry, but I didn't tell her how long I'd known. I told her to go be happy with her doctor lover. She screamed at me, tried to lie, and then made the mistake of rushing toward me. The deputy stopped her and warned her that women go to jail for domestic violence too, now. He suggested she pack a bag to stay somewhere else. Carrie left after I promised not to tell the kids about her affair. I didn't tell the kids. But I told my mother, who told my sister, who told her kids, who told their cousins, my kids. It took a few days, but eventually the kids knew that dad was divorcing mom because, she had a boyfriend. In the end, the court granted the divorce, giving me primary custody of our kids, because I was already their primary caretaker, I kept the house with the promise I'd refinance to buy out Carrie's half. She was ordered to pay child support, and I used that fact to negotiate with her to give up any rights to my retirement if I bought her out. I was able to refinance my home, it was the era when banks threw money at everyone to buy or refinance a mortgage, and with a little money borrowed from my parents, I bought out Carrie's community property interest in the home and in my retirement. The day she signed all the paperwork with my lawyer finally ending any possible financial obligations to her, was the happiest I'd been. I felt like I could finally breathe. I celebrated with Anne who'd been my rock through all of it. I'm not ashamed to say that through the years I'd cried many times in her arms. Anne and I would eventually marry. She got promoted to a higher position and I was convinced to take back my previous position at the district when my youngest child reached high school. Carrie and I got along well after the divorce. We took the kids to family therapy and worked out this co-parenting thing. For the few months, she took a beating from the kids about, why you need a boyfriend when daddy was there all along? Between the kids and the therapist raking her over the coals, I didn't have to say anything at all. Carrie missed a lot of time with the kids, because of her now legitimately busy work schedule and I actually felt bad that my kids were missing time with their mother, so encouraged them to talk to her on the phone instead. When Carrie found out that I'd proposed to Anne, she congratulated me. I told her it's okay for her to marry Perry, too. She got sad. She told me that Perry had started seeing another woman, a younger nurse at the hospital, because with her new position, she didn't have time for him and when they did get together, she wasn't fun anymore. My ex-wife, the woman who'd cheated on me and destroyed our marriage, was looking to me for sympathy. I had none to give. What I had was years of anger and frustration. Years of knowing some other man was sleeping with my wife. I'd lost weight from not being able to eat, I'd suffered hypertension and had to confide in my doctor why it wasn't the stress of my job. I had to listen to my dentist complain about how I was grinding and listening to him tell me I'd need dental implants if it kept up. There were times when I had to be intimate with Carrie to keep up the charade, fortunately and frequently, only to lie that I wanted to use condoms too, 
remind us how we used to have sexy time when we were dating or, because I might have a bladder infection. Then go take a STD test anyway and wait for the results before seeing Anne again. But in the end, it was all worth it. Sure, Carrie got a big payout when I bought her out of the house and my retirement, which she was trickling back to me through child support, but she lost everything else. Her kids only saw her every other weekend and spent a couple of holidays with her. Perry dumped her and he was no great catch anyway, since he was twice divorced with five kids and paying alimony and child support through the nose. I kept my kids, my house, my income, my retirement, I got Anne, and I am genuinely happy. All in a community property state with no fault divorce. If that's not pro-revenge, then I don't know what is. I've been wanting to share my story for ages, but I just never got around to doing it. So, then I figured, since I have a Reddit account now, I might as well post it. When I was around 17, I started dating a guy who was 19, I'll call him Jake. Also age of consent where I live is 16, so nothing illegal happening here. Jake was a bisexual male. We got on well, spent a lot of time together and cared for each other a lot. We even started talking about living together once we both moved out. We were a perfectly happy couple. Or so I thought. You see, after we'd been dating for a few months, something in Jake changed. He was getting a lot more distant. Whenever he was with me, he'd be checking his phone constantly. We stopped spending as much time together and he started to get really funny about public affection, regarding things like hand holding and stuff. He also seemed to start caring less and less about my feelings. I used to have a bit of a thing for humiliation in the bedroom, nothing too far and we'd spoken about what Jake should and shouldn't say, but he started to get more and more degrading. He'd tell me how no one would ever love me and would pick on my insecurities, I actually broke down crying a few times when this happened. To give him a bit of credit, the first few times he did stop everything he was doing and apologized to me until I felt better, but eventually that stopped too and he just began rolling his eyes and telling me to grow up. He was like a completely different person. The insults started to seep into our everyday life. He'd pick on my appearance a lot, bring up my family, I was dealing with a lot of family issues at the time. He'd bring up the fact that I slept around before we started dating, a sort of rebellion caused by family issues, etc. If I got upset by it, he'd just leave the room and let me cry by myself. I started to feel like it was my fault our relationship was falling apart, maybe I just wasn't good enough for him. I knew deep down that he was cheating on me and that was confirmed when I got a message from a guy named David. He messaged me on Facebook, telling me that he'd been sleeping with Jake. He apologized profusely and told me that he broke things off with Jake as soon as he found out he was in a relationship. I couldn't be mad at David, it wasn't his fault. We spoke for hours and I reassured David that it wasn't his fault and that he'd done nothing wrong. David also helped me to stop making excuses for Jake's attitude and the way he'd been acting. He was a godsend. The thing that truly broke me, happened not too long after the cheating was discovered. We'd been arguing a hell of a lot more. Then he decided to do something absolutely unforgivable. You see, I had a stained relationship with my father for years. He'd cheat on my mother constantly and eventually, he settled down and had kids with a girl he'd been seeing behind her back. He did try to have some sort of relationship with me till I was about 14, and then decided that he didn't love me as much as his other kids and we stopped all contact. It broke me and it still hurts to think about to this day. Anyway, Jake went out of his way to find on of my step-siblings online and slept with them. He bragged about it the next day, my step-sibling actually posted online about what had happened and I received a bunch of messages from their friends telling me how I had deserved it. This was probably the lowest point in my life and I hated myself, partly for allowing it to happen and partly because I had started to believe what they were saying. My only solace during this time was David, I didn't want to burden my friends with my problems and David was one of the only people who knew, firsthand what Jake was like. We spoke for a few weeks and eventually talk blossomed to revenge. I had tried calling things off a couple of months prior due to Jake's awful behavior, but he started with the apologies and telling me he didn't mean it, he'd never do it again. 
He even spoke to some of my family members who, unknowingly, pressured me to get back together with him as we were such a sweet couple. I hadn't wanted to tell them the real reason that we'd broken up, so I kept the details pretty vague, though I'm pretty sure some of them had seen my step-siblings post and knew why I didn't want to be with him. After weeks of talking and planning, I had finally had enough and decided to do something about it. My father wasn't exactly a rich man, but he worked a pretty well-paying job and earned enough money to live fairly comfortably. He had begun spreading rumors around when I was younger, during a custody battle with my mother, that he had set up a trust fund for me and that there was enough money there to get me set up in my own place when I was 18, plus a bit extra. I knew that this was absolute horse doo-doo, he tried to get out of paying child support all the time, of course he'd never set up a trust fund for me. However, Jake didn't. We'd never spoken about it, but he'd heard the rumors and I'd just always say what I told you folks, my father was an appalling parent who grudged paying my mother's child support, so why would he set up a trust fund? But Jake wouldn't listen, he even did his own research into the type of job my father worked and came up with an estimate of how much he thought my father was earning. Though, to his credit, he did drop the subject whenever I asked him to, for a while anyways. I decided to use this to my advantage. Jake and I were still dating though I avoided him at any chance I got. Until one night where I sat him down and told him that since I'd be turning 18 in a couple of weeks, I'd started thinking about us getting our own place. With the trust fund my father had set up for me. He immediately cheered up at this. I think that night, was the first time in months that he'd said anything nice to me when we weren't in public or with friends or family. This very nearly made me want to call the whole thing off, but I spoke with David later that night and he reminded me that Jake would go back to his usual degrading attitude in no time. We started looking at flats, though Jake was kind enough to let me have the final say and handle the paperwork, because how could he possibly go out and cheat on me, if he had to sort out the paperwork for a flat? I was a little surprised by this to be very honest, as I'd always thought that he'd want his name on the paperwork and everything so I couldn't kick him out. But by this point he'd slept with my step-sibling, degraded me, smashed my self-confidence to pieces and cheated on me regularly, I think by now he thought that I wouldn't kick him out no matter what he did. Anyways, I started taking up extra shifts at work to try and save enough money to actually move out. Not with Jake though, oh no. I was moving in with my friend, Emma. We had both been thinking about moving out for a while anyways and thought, why not just be roommates? We found a cute little one-bedroom flat that was close to our college and work and started getting stuff sorted to move in. I also didn't want to bring any trouble to my mother's door, if Jake started kicking up a fuss, Emma had no issues with clawing the face off him if need be, and told me not to worry about him coming to our front door. Then came the next part of the plan. I waited till a week or so before Jake and I were supposedly moving into our own flat and stole his phone for a few minutes. He'd stopped caring about leaving his phone unattended, and would sometimes flat out brag about how lucky he was to be able to sleep with whoever he wanted and come home to, a little which who'd make him dinner. So that day when he went for a shower, he wasn't all too bothered about taking his phone with him. Perfect. I went onto his phone, deleted my number from his contacts and changed the name of his mom's contact as mine. Pleased, I went to the kitchen, smashed one of the plates. I left for work once everything was done, my mother had left for work a couple hours prior so she was safe. I just needed a reason for him to get pissed off. And oh boy, did he get pissed off. His first reaction was to text me, calling me all the disgusting names under the sun. Except it wasn't me he'd texted, it was his mum. I'd texted her in advance and told her that I hoped she'd forgive me, but she had to see what her son was really like. She'd never tried to defend him as much as she just hadn't known quite how bad his behavior was. She'd actually called him out a couple of times where he'd slipped up and been harsh with me when she was there. She, went, apeshit. I never found out exactly how their argument went, as she phoned him to scream at him and call him out for his awful behavior, finally seeing how horrible her son was. It didn't help that she'd been sent screenshots of some of the times where he'd admitted to cheating. She was absolutely disgusted by her son's behavior and phoned me to apologize on Jake's behalf. It wasn't her fault though, he's old enough to know how to act like an adult. 
He wound up telling his mom essentially that her opinion didn't matter as he'd be moving in with me anyways. Needless to say, when he called me on Facebook after I deleted my number from his phone, I took some satisfaction in telling him that we weren't moving in together, that the trust fund wasn't real, which I already told him in the past, he just refused to listen, and that I'd moved in with Emma. I was called all the skanks and whores under the sun, his voice sort of turned into white noise after a while. I told him we were over and hung up. Blocked him on everything. He had to run back to his mom and dad, his tail between his legs, and they took him back for a little while. Though after a bit, the fights and arguments became too much and his parents kicked him out. He stayed with a couple of friends for a few months, before he managed to get his own place. His parents, especially his mother, has not been the same with him since. I still talk to his mom on occasion. Lastly, David and I took the liberty of sending screenshots of Jake's abuse to as many of the people he'd been hooking up with as possible. A couple of sleepless nights were spent trying to track people down on Facebook. Part of it was to get back at Jake, but most of it was just to make sure that none of them got roped into a full-on relationship with him and had to deal with all the crap I'd gone through. Due to my story that is still developing, I can only share how far I got till now. My partner George and I were monogamous for 10 years. We had an occasional threesome before that, but nothing long term. I know I'm potentially going to get a few people who will say that's where the trouble started. The understanding was, that we would not do anything behind the other's back. And whomever we brought into the relationship, would be an equal in the relationship. We wanted to have our couple evolve into a thruple. Needless to say, it didn't work out. We tried, but with the last person we tried with, we ended up in court. Admittedly, I wasn't bringing my best self to the relationship. Two people who basically raised me died and I was in mourning. And I was focused on the rest of my family whom I love dearly. During this time, George cheated on me and lied about it. He used my disease, lupus, and wanting to spend time with his family as his justification for cheating. Spread over a few days before the COVID lockdowns. In March, my partner had told me he wanted some time apart. I initially agreed, but then things just didn't seem right. I thought we were fine relationship-wise. But something seemed amiss. I have my own place and I give him some space. We would only have dinner sometime since it was what we were used to doing together, this is important for later. One Sunday, he tells me he has a spa massage session that evening and that he would be busy and wouldn't be able to meet till late for dinner. I didn't think anything was going on behind my back, he said he would call when he was done and not to wait for him for dinner. I needed a notebook I had left at his place and thinking he was having his spa session, I let myself into his place. Lo and behold, he's having dinner with a guy named John. I leave and he assures me that he's just having dinner with a friend and that his spa session got rescheduled. I asked, point blank if anything was going on between them and he said no. Next Wednesday, I'm just a complete wreck. I don't know what's going on, I don't know what's true and what's real anymore and I get the gut feel that there's more to George and John than he's letting me in on. I do some sleuthing and find out that they're friends on Facebook, but not on Instagram. This makes me curious. Yet they've been liking each other's posts on Instagram. I remember George logging into my iPad, so I go on and check for any message history. And wouldn't you know, I see exchanges between them going on for months. Once again, I ask George who this person is, with whom he's friends with on Facebook, but not on Instagram and why their interactions are so bizarre. George tells me he's just a friend nothing more, and that I'm crazy. My blood must have been boiling at this point. I then remind him that he's still logged into my iPad and his face just changes. He tells me that I betrayed his trust and that I really shouldn't have done that. He must have been in full-blown panic mode. In their messages, I find out that they've been seeing each other since September 2019. I had an emergency appendectomy in October 2019. The very next day while I was recovering in the hospital, George and John went out for dinner and John stayed over after. No prizes for guessing what happened that night. They're talking about me in their conversations, and they even arranged to meet that day I saw them. John asked if I would show up again and George said that I wouldn't. At this point, 
my whole life before just felt like one big fat lie. I'm having plenty of sleepless nights, thinking about how I'm the chump they were fooling for five months. I was none the wiser. Furious, I engaged revenge for hire service. I hired private investigators a friend recommended to me. Shout out to my Asian friend, LA Asians are pretty crazy, no hate. She's been a great ally in this. I wasn't thinking clearly in caveat emptor, I lucked out with a service that did a good job. I gave them all the information about John the first had, not much, just his social media accounts. They proceeded their investigative work, they dug up quite a bit of dirt on him. Turns out, John was in a relationship as well. Inform the partner? Check. George wasn't the only person John was cheating with. They managed to find some chat history of his hookups all the way to 2017. What's most interesting, is that John enjoyed using illicit drugs while having these trysts, complete with contact information of parties involved and locations where it happened. They dug deeper and found conversations where he would advise friends to commit insurance fraud. Nothing major mind you, but well fraud is still fraud. And from the conversations, it seems that the insurers did pay out for bogus travel delays. The revenge agency then asks me how I would like to proceed with the information. I told them, I just want his life ruined. My life and relationship have been ruined, why not share a little of the pain I was feeling? The agency said that they had informed all parties involved. Last I heard, his insurance agencies dropped him, on the basis of encouraging insurance fraud, and he has a criminal record for drug use. Now that he has a criminal record, it means he can no longer travel to Canada or Japan, countries he loves to visit. His family knows that he's been cheating and using drugs. And his partner knows he's been sexy timing around without protection. For George, I'm not finished with him just yet, there's more revenge in store. He's not getting away. Thank you for enjoying this episode, which was made with artificial love. Subscribe or give Royal AI some sugar by avenging the like button. Could you imagine doing one of these acts yourself? Share your experience below. I'll join the conversation.